Outside Health and Fitness Podcast, Episode 117. Happiness is with Mike Ferry. What psychologists refer to as the happiness neurotransmitter. So the more exercise we get, especially exercise that's outside, then the happier we're going to be. Welcome to the Outside Health and Fitness Podcast. We're getting outside the box, outside our comfort zone, and outside and in shape. If you're bored with the same old fitness routine at the gym and you're ready to try something new, then this is the show for you. We're exploring new and fun ways to get fit on the trail, on the water, on the slopes, and outside. Hi, this is Steve Stearns from OutsideHealthAndFitness.com. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of the Outside Health and Fitness Podcast. If you're new to the show, we like to stay fit and active by having fun outside. We like to ride, slide, run, walk, hike, bike, golf, golf, swim, and ski. If it's fun outside and it keeps us healthy, then we love it. If you're like us and you want to be healthy, active, and have fun outside, then you've found the right place. Have you ever noticed how some people just seem to be happy all the time? Is that because they're lucky? Are they born that way? And what about the stuff that we talk about? We like to get outside. We like to be active and work on our health and find fun and creative new ways to be active. Are, are those things that can contribute to happiness? Well, my guest today, Mike Ferry, a happiness expert, says, yes, there are things we can do to control our own happiness. And he shares some really great information on the show today. I think you're going to be impressed. And you're going to be super happy when you stay tuned after my interview with Mike to find out what Jessica Bailey has to say about getting more out of your bicep curls in this week's Sassy Girl Exercise Tune-Up. Outside HealthAndFitness.com So last time on the show, I spoke with Chris Cage from Green Belly Bar, and he developed this really interesting meal replacement bar that is all-natural, healthy, doesn't require you to cook anything or boil any water, and it tastes great. I actually had a couple of these. Chris was nice enough to send them over, and they really do taste great. If you are somebody who is health conscious and on the go, or you're a hiker or a distance athlete, you're going to love these Green Belly Bars. So make sure that you check out that episode. And if you missed that episode, you might have also missed some of the other exclusive articles and information that I send out every week in the newsletter. You know, the newsletter is great. It comes right to your inbox, a little brief about the show that's coming up, some articles and guest posts. Very cool. And I also include a free Tabata morning routine as a thank you for signing up for the newsletter. The Tabata routine is something that I do myself in the morning, and it only takes four minutes. You give it everything you got, and you're exhausted by the time that you're done, but it revs up your metabolism for the entire day, and it's a ton of fun to do. So make sure you go over to outsidehealthandfitness.com forward slash 117. Sign up for the free newsletter right now, and I'll be here when you get back. I am happy to wait for you. Not a problem. All right, so let's get right into my interview with happiness expert Mike Ferry. Okay, Mike, this is fantastic. I am so excited to have you on Outside Health and Fitness. Welcome to the show. Well, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. Great. So we're going to talk all about happiness, which is an awesome topic. I mean, it just makes you smile to think about that, doesn't it? <laughs> it sure does. <laughs> so, th And this is kind of a weird question, but, you know, actually, I think this is probably the weirdest <laughs> question that I've asked anybody, but how'd you get into happiness? <laughs> well, uh, I have to say that I've never considered myself a really unhappy person. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've been really fortunate to have a great family background growing up. And of course, now my wife, Jenny, and my, my family life is, is great. I really have no complaints at all. Um, but I, you know, I first got into the science of happiness a few years ago um, at a Learning in the Brain conference in San Francisco. And that really energized me as a teacher as a, and as a father. Um, and that's the experience that propelled me to write my book, Teaching Happiness and Innovation, yeah, and that got me on the path to sharing this message with as many people as possible. That's great, and you know, it's, it's that's a very interesting concept of teaching happiness because you feel like happiness just kind of happens to you or doesn't happen to you. Can you talk a little bit about teaching it? How do you teach happiness? 
Well, of course, that's a great question, and that's right at the heart of what I do. But it, the, the science of happiness has evolved over the last 20 or 30 years or so, and um, you know, primarily as our understanding of, of the brain has changed and as our ability to look at brain imaging and get a sense of what's going on in there has changed. But as it turns out, we can shape our emotions based on our habits. Mm-hmm. And if, if you want to be a happier person, there are specific things that you can do from a brain standpoint that, um, that, will, make it, that will make happiness more likely for yourself and for your kids and for anyone else in your life. That's great. That's awesome. So, so you can learn these things, or, or in your case, you can teach these things to people, and you, you can be in control of your own happiness that way. Yeah, well, without a doubt, you know, we, we don't have to wait or hope that happiness will descend from the heavens. Uh, we, we can go out and create it. I love it. So, so what are some of these habits that you teach people? Well, of course, in the book, Teaching Happiness and Innovation, I, I have a, uh, many of them that I talk about. But one of these that's actually very simple for us to implement in our own lives is gratitude. Mm. Um, you know, people who are grateful tend to be much happier. And also people who are happy tend to find more success in life. So if you want to do better in school or in work or um, you know, personal relationships or anything, you're more likely to find success if you're a happier person, and you're more likely to be happy if you could become more grateful. You know, many of us are wired to whine, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but with practice, you can turn that around and become hardwired for gratitude and much happier as a result. I know for me that, obviously, it's outside health and fitness, but when I get outside, when I have a chance to be outside, and you and I were talking before we get going here about how cold it's been and how tough it's been this winter. I haven't really been able to get outside much, but just being able to get outside seems to make me happier or or improve my mood. Is there, is there something going on with that as well? Yeah. Well, whenever we move, whenever we get any kind of exercise whatsoever, of course, there are lots of things that happen in our brains, uh, a number of different chemicals that are released that make us feel better and protect our body from injury and all that sort of thing. But one of the chemicals that's involved in any kind of movement whatsoever is dopamine, Mm -hmm. which is what psychologists refer to as the happiness neurotransmitter. So the more exercise we get, especially exercise that's outside, then the happier we're going to be. Excellent. And, you know, know, conversely, if if you're mired in a winter that's been as cold as ours has been, (laughs) This year, then, uh, you know, if you can't move around as much, then that has a negative impact on your overall mood. I know we up, up here in Maine, a lot of times we'll see on the news, they'll talk about cabin fever. And that's that idea of you're indoors, just kind of sitting around, you're not moving, you're not active, you're not doing things. And it does seem to settle in and change people's moods. Yeah, yeah, definitely, without a doubt. I know you're a, a dad, and I'm a dad, and I have... Uh, one son who is a an adult now, but I have two. I have another son and a daughter who are going to be going through the teenage years. And I remember going through the teenage years, and sometimes teenagers aren't that happy. Is there anything that you can share to help those of us that are facing the teenage years get through that? Help our kids well, be happier. Well, sure, absolutely. Well, you know. First would be to practice the gratitude that I mentioned right off the bat. Yep. The second would be, you know, to encourage as much exercise as possible. What we just talked about, if uh, if your kids play on a sports team and uh, in middle school or high school, then that's great. Uh, if not, then find some other kind of extracurricular way to get as much exercise as possible. Yep. But also, I would say encourage creativity as much as possible. Uh, creativity is another one of those habits of happiness. Uh, you know, I mentioned dopamine a few minutes ago, but creativity is another activity that you can do that elevates your dopamine level in your brain. So if you're doing if you're doing anything at all that's creative, whether it's writing a poem or a song or making a movie or and you know anything you can imagine, uh, it's just going to make you feel better. And 
uh, you know, the kids that spend a lot of time being creative tend to be much happier than those who don't. And I guess this really goes to, you know, a lot of those school programs, keeping yourself active, either physically active or keeping your brain active, being creative and, and being excited about things that that's going to keep you in a better place, keep you keep you happy. And when you're talking about those, talking about gratitude, is there something formal that you have people do? I mean, do you, do you write down like a gratitude journal or how do you do that? Uh, well, yeah. So, so in, in my history classes, it's uh, sixth grade history. Mm-hmm. Uh, from time to time, we'll have a moment of gratitude. And that's when I ask my students to take out a sheet of paper and draw a picture or maybe write down a short phrase of anything you're grateful for. Nice. And it, as the teacher, it's really cool for me to see kids drawing pictures of ice cream cones or dogs <laughs> or the beach or, you know, baseball bats or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so, I, you know, it's really endearing to experience that. But the thing is, the more you practice it, if this becomes a routine and something that you return to over and over and over again, it will have a difference at the neural level. Your, uh, your neural pathways in your brain will will alter to become more grateful. So uh, ultimately, you don't even have to think about it. Your brain just takes over and is more grateful as sort of a new default setting, and you'll be much happier as a result. Right. So you're kind of almost reprogramming yourself. Without a doubt. And practice makes perfect. That works for whether we're riding our mountain bike or working on uh, you know, pitching a baseball or playing the violin, and it works for gratitude and any other intellectual thing that we want to do. Yeah. Now, I, I would imagine that happiness also translates into some physical health benefits as well. Well, yeah, you're absolutely right. The findings are showing that the happier you are, the longer your longevity is mm-hmm. expected to be. Also, if you're happier, then you're less likely to get stressed out. And as we know, stress is horrendous for your health. It yeah. breaks down your cells, destroys your, your brain structure, causes premature aging and high blood pressure and all that stuff. So yes, it, if you can forge a personality that is happy more often than not and uh, is much more optimistic than it might otherwise be, then you're going to have significant health benefits. I think it's fantastic that you're doing this with children too, because even though you think, boy, children should be happy anyway, what a great time to forge this habit, this lifelong habit. Well, you're absolutely right. It's essential that we get kids on the right track as early as possible. And of course, we were just talking about the teenage years and how difficult that period of life can be. It's during adolescence that we experience so much change, physical, moral, uh, cognitive, everything you can imagine. And one of those changes relates to the flow of dopamine in our brains. Mm. And actually, as we enter adolescence and young adulthood, our dopamine flow radically reduces. So you know, ki- younger kids are just sort of naturally happy a lot of the time. Yeah, That, that changes, and that's related to uh, you know, a lower presence of that happiness neurotransmitter. But we can create it. And if we teach our kids how they can return to the elevated levels they used to enjoy, then they'll be much happier as a result. That's really powerful information. I mean, that's, it's a physical change that takes place in the body and there are things that we can do to help there. You can see I'm very, I'm very caught up on this teenage thing. I know it's coming. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Hey, you're doing the smart thing to try to prepare yourself. (laughs) Um, but you, and actually, it, it helps us not only during our teenage years, but uh, you know, if we experience health issues later in life, mm. like with Parkinson's or or some other kind of uh, malady, you know, a lot of the time it, that causes our dopamine levels and you know serotonin and oxytocin and other things to be depressed. Right. But again, through our behavior, we can correct that. So that's interesting. I hadn't really considered that. Have you done any work with folks that have a serious diagnosis, or do you know of someone that's been doing any work like that? Well, there's a family friend back in uh, in Greensboro, North Carolina, where I grew up, and uh, actually I heard from my mom, who was speaking with this family friend, 
saying that uh, she was finding my book really helpful because she knew that she was having difficulty with her own mood. And she's uh, just so grateful that she knows these specific behaviors like, uh, you know, like kindness and gratitude and creativity and other things. You know, she can get herself on the right foot just by changing a few aspects of her daily life. That's fantastic. That must make you feel really good. Well, it's been so cool to hear the feedback uh, as my book has gotten out there. Uh, I released Teaching Happiness and Innovation back in August, and you know, teachers have loved it, parents have loved it, grandparents, and it's it's really starting to find a home out there, and the reach is, uh, I have to say, is wider than I anticipated, and it's just really, really exciting to know that these ideas are making a difference. Now, you said in the book, it's teaching happiness and innovation. Now, is the innovation, the is that the creativity part of it? Well, creativity is one of the most important facets of innovation. You know, in addition to just having a more open-minded mindset and a willingness to push yourself, also getting more practice and collaborating with others and thinking critically. Yeah. But you know, when you think about it, we really do need to teach these skills because, as we all know, the future is going to be radically different from the present. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that there's there's an estimate out of Oxford University that says uh, within the next 20 years, somewhere around 47 percent of existing American jobs might be automated. Mm. So we're talking about half of all jobs right now being performed by robots. Right. So we've got to do something. We've got to help our kids learn the skills that will allow them to create a new reality when they enter adulthood. It's going to be like the Jetsons, right, with Rosie and all that stuff. <laughs> do you remember that? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still waiting for the, the Star Trek thing where I can beam myself over someplace, but I'm sure that's coming. Oh, um, that, that would be so cool. Wouldn't that be awesome? Your book, where could somebody get your book? Well, the, if you want the ebook version, then you can go to Amazon Kindle or Barnes & Noble Nook or the iBookstore. Yeah. Uh, if you're looking for a print copy, you can go to my website, which is happinessandinnovation.com. Okay. And actually, if you go to my website, you can download a free section from the book. Uh, it's actually a section that deals with gratitude. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is sign my mailing list, which is a way to keep in touch with your future writings that I do. Uh, you know, I'm also a musician, so yeah. you'll find you'll find out about songs that I'm writing and performances and that sort of thing. But if you can just sign up for my email list, you can download a section of the book, Teaching Happiness and Innovation. And if you like what you read, then you can order the book on the site. That's fantastic. That's awesome. I love your site. I've I've been over there, and there's a lot of really cool stuff. And you play you play violin, correct? Well, I started playing the violin when I was four, and then gradually I moved into some other instruments. So I play piano and guitar, mandolin, in addition to the violin. And I, nice. I also uh, also enjoy recording. And of course, I sing too. So yeah. yeah, so yes, if you go to my site, happinessandinnovation.com, and you click on Mike's Tunes, you can listen to a bunch of songs that I've put up there. And actually, you can download my music for free in exchange for performing an act of kindness for another person. I love and, that. And uh, you know, th this, is, this is my <laughs> way, uh, you know, a very modest way to try to make the world a better place. But also, as I was talking about, kindness is another one of those activities related to dopamine. Yeah. So the kinder we are, the happier we are, the, the more we appreciate my music, and you know, the, the safer, more prosperous, and more sustainable our world will be. Believe it or not, I am a musician as well. And I tried playing violin, and I was able to produce happiness because I stopped, and my grandfather was very happy because <laughs> it was painful. So I, yeah. I really appreciate uh, someone that can play the violin. It's not easy. No, it's uh, it's definitely one of those instruments that can uh, can cause severe pain at first. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You're gonna get past that part. That's right. Well, that's fantastic, Mike. I, I really uh, appreciate you coming on and talking about happiness. I just think it's such a great topic, and the, and the things that you're doing to, to help kids learn how to be happy at that 
age. I just think it's fantastic. And I'm going to make sure that we have links in the show notes to your website so people can go over there, check out everything that you do, initiate an act of kindness, download some music, all that stuff. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Uh, also, I'll mention for your listeners who are on Twitter, you know, please reach out and connect with me there. Uh, you could yes. find me at Mike Ferry 7 Mike Ferry 7 Mike Ferry 7 And I think we're connected on Twitter, so I'll make yeah, sure yeah. to put that, put that in there, too. Great. Thank you. All right. That's great. Uh, anything else that you want to cover before we sign off? Well, I guess just to say that you, our happiness is something that we can create ourselves. We can be happier tomorrow, and it's entirely within our grasp to have a much better quality of life, uh, a much more optimistic mental well-being perspective. And I hope that we can do this for ourselves as adults and also that we can teach our kids so that we can all have the, the best quality lives possible. I really do love that that part that, you know, it's something that we're in control of. I think mean, it's great. Well, it's, yeah, it's 100% uh, true, borne out by the research. And it's empowering to realize that mm. you don't have to wait for it. It's not something that happens by chance. It's It emanates from within, and we can make that happen. Well, thanks again, Mike. I, I really appreciate you uh, coming on the show. Well, sure thing. It's been a lot of fun. Okay, it's time for the Sassy Girl Exercise Tune-Up with my good friend, fitness instructor, Jessica Bailey. Jessica is back to help you tune up some of your favorite exercises so you can get the maximum benefit from the time you put in. All right, Jessica, how are you? Hey, Steve, how's it going? Not too bad, not too bad. So what are we talking about this week? So this week I want to talk about the bicep curl. All right, one of my favorites. And um, most people do this because do it wrong because they're trying to lift too much weight mm. and it engages the shoulders and reduces the effort on the biceps. So if the weight is too heavy, you'll be working the shoulders and not properly targeting your biceps. So and to get your shoulders from not hunching forward, you want to keep your chest up yeah. and you want to stand tall with your shoulder blades back and down and contract your abs. I mean, that is the most important thing. I see it all the time in class. People just let their abs go. Yeah. Like, don't do that because what happens is if you just let your abs go, your shoulders start to come forward. Your shoulder blades either come up to your ears. So you got to keep your abs contracted and then keep your back and elbows and your shoulders still. Like, right. they should not be moving. So I like to think and cue, keep your elbows near the seam of your shirt. And you curl your arms up until they're in front of your shoulders. So the weights don't actually have to touch for this to be correct. You curl it all the way up without your elbows leaving your sides. Mm -hmm. So if your elbows leave your sides, yeah, of course, you'd be able to touch the weight to your shoulder. But you're not effectively engaging the bicep. You're engaging the shoulder. See, I see a lot of people, and particularly if, if it's too much weight, you see these people that they're almost using a pendulum-like motion to get it up there. And then... You look at them and you go, man, you are like this close to tweaking your back. They're using momentum is what they're doing. Yeah, yeah exactly. And it's not, they're not really engaging. So re most important is if you can't do the exercise with the correct technique, it means the weight is too heavy. Maybe this is an old myth and you can straighten me out on this, but heavier weight was used to kind of build the muscle up, but mm -hmm. a lighter weight and more reps was to kind of tone or kind of cut the muscle a little bit more. Is that true? lie. Oh, uh, I no, fell for it. It's not true. If you are using lighter weights, think about it. You're just using your joints and you're using the tendons and ligaments mm -hmm. to help support you. And if you are using light weights and you have to do like twice as many reps to get the same burn, you're not effectively using that muscle and you're not challenging it. So workout is about challenge, right? So yeah. you pick up the weight that's going to challenge you the most and go for it. Oh, all right. Yeah. Well, I got straightened out. Thank you. That's great. You're welcome. So that's probably why I look like I do. I've been falling for all these myths all these years. Oh, man. Good thing I'm here to set you straight. <sighs> no kidding. <laughs> all right. Thanks. As always, that was a great tip. You can get more awesome tips like that on Jessica's site at sassygirlfitnessnyc.com. Also, Jessica and I have a new show called Funky Fitness Now where we take a fun look at the weird, wacky, and kooky things people do to get fit. Check it out at funkyfitnessnow.com. 
So today we learned that happiness doesn't just happen to you. It's something that you have control over. When you're grateful, active, creative, and kind, it creates that feeling of happiness within you. And when you work to develop these habits in yourself and share them with the children in your life, you'll be happier. I want to thank Mike Ferry for coming on the show and sharing all this great information with you and I today. Mike has an amazing website, and I'll have links in the show notes so that you can check out his book, you can check out his music, all the fun and happy stuff he has going on over there. So visit OutsideHealthAndFitness.com forward slash 117 for all of the links that we talked about in today's show. Thank you again, too, for listening to the show. I know it takes some time out of your day, and I appreciate you being here. And if you enjoyed the show today, please leave us a review in whichever podcast player you like to use. Thank you so much, and I'll see you outside.